Yes! All the remix music in this episode is provided by the album Determination, available on Bandcamp now. Links are in the description below. Warning! This entire episode is a spoiler for the pure Undertale experience. Proceed at your own risk, but we prefer if you played Undertale on your own first. Enjoy the show, and relax, bud. It's Friday. You made it. All right, this is the Undertale episode, remember? Yeah, I know. No mess-ups, or the internet's gonna come get you, okay? Right, sure, I know, we're gonna do Undertale, we're gonna do it right, okay? Here we go. Hey, everyone, and welcome back to the brand- Whoa, 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 whoa. What? Just came at it pretty hard, I thought. You don't want to start them like this. This is the Undertale episode, after all. It gotta be nice. I know, just, I got this. I do this every week. This is my job. <laughs> Hey everyone, and welcome back okay, to the Okay, stop. Brand new what are you doing? What do I need to tell you to get through to this? Is that a dog? Is that a freaking dog? Alex replaced himself with the dog. Whoa. Oh my god. Whose dog is that? Get the... Start the review. Start the review. Start it. No? Fine, I'm leaving. So. Undertale. Okay, okay, okay. I don't want to start. You want to do this? You're gonna hate it anyways. You're gonna hate this anyways. Why do we do this video? Turn the video off. No, you're gonna hate this anyway. Turn it off. Turn it off. Turn it off. This guy. Star wipe. Star wipe. Sweetie. From where I'm standing, Undertale is the epitome of a runaway hit. No one, especially not creator Toby Fox, had any idea it would become this universally loved, and the people who hate it will probably never understand why. So, the question is, what is so special about Undertale? The first thing everybody brings up is its similarity to the 1994 Shigesato Itoi cult classic Earthbound, and interestingly enough, that connection actually does date back to Undertale's inception. The first anyone ever heard of the game was in a post from back in early 2013 in the PK hack form at starmen.net, whoop whoop, where Toby Fox, who was better known as Radiation at the time, was joking about an Earthbound ROM hack he was making called Underbound 2. Or not. Don't believe everything you read on the internet, kids. Looking to create a game with non-traditional mechanics, which also effectively use video games as a storytelling medium, the next we heard of Undertale was when the demo debuted in May of 2013 on a fan gamer livestream. It was so successful that a public demo followed a few weeks later, and a week or two after that, a modest Kickstarter was launched for $5,000 worth of development funds. But apparently the internet chose Undertale for greatness pretty early on, since by the time it ended, that Kickstarter hit its goal 10 times over for a grand total of almost 2,400 people, giving a total of $51,000. That is a lot of dollars. From there, the game took over two years to finish, but when it finally came out, it did so to almost universal acclaim. Already, the game has practically been elevated from cult status to mainstream hit, and the dedication of its fan base is so overwhelming that a lot of people on the internet, myself included, are scared to even go near it for fear of being swallowed up by a horde of rabid perfectionists whose understanding and love of the game will always be better than yours. Not to mention, there is a lot of weird fan art and I mean a lot. Whew. It's also had what I imagine to be a pretty unfortunate effect on Toby Fox's life by transforming him into a reclusive legend, similar to Scott Cawthon of Five Nights at Freddy's fame, who's not so much being antisocial as he is hiding from thousands of people who are probably looking at his game much more closely than he ever did himself. On the one hand, I want to be cynical about an overhyped game. It creates millions of people waiting to say it's awesome no matter what awful problems it has. But I'd be an idiot to say that now because Undertale is actually really clean and really good. Yeah, and luckily it seems like for the most part people are realizing that. In fact, 
that might even be over-realizing it. I've seen firsthand the way people in this industry talk about the possibility of even just meeting Toby Fox these days, and it makes me feel for what his inbox must look like every morning. When we started our blind playthrough on Super Beer Bros a few months ago, we had no idea what was in store, but the game quickly won us over, and I instantly got excited for the episode I was eventually going to get to do. And now that I am, I'm surprised at how hard it was for me to talk about this game in terms of actual completion. I kind of don't even want to go over it now that I have to, right? So now, you out there are asking, what kind of game is this anyway? What could possibly stop you from wanting to make a video about a game you absolutely love? Honestly, I don't know if we'll ever be able to fully express that to you, but we're determined to try. Here's another spoiler warning. We're just about to give away the plot. If this is all too much for you, maybe just go watch some anime. ANIME! Undertale's story works from several different angles, but before you can change the whole outcome by making some absolutely sweeping choices, the gist of it is this. A long time ago, there was a war between humans and monsters. The humans won, and the monsters were sealed underground behind an almost unbreakable magic barrier. The monsters have started to get used to a human-free lifestyle in their closed-off little kingdom, but in general the land feels sad and twisted, like everyone who lives there is totally depressed and wigged out. Fast forward to the year 20x teen, and we hear stories of people, possibly even children, climbing to the top of a mysterious Mount Ebbett, never to be seen again. One of these kids is you, the as yet unnamed gender neutral protagonist who climbs to the top alone only to find a giant hole. After going to get a closer look, you fall in and wake to find yourself among the old ruins in the underground kingdom of the monsters. Sounds like the beginning of a classic JRPG so far, right? But from the very first interaction you have with Flowey, a sweet little nihilistic flower who literally tries to kill you for its own amusement, you begin to realize that nothing is as it seems and that Toby Fox was extremely successful at making each monster you encounter feel like an individual with its own motivations and feelings. Plus, the game gives you the option of handling all fights without the use of violence, which has a major effect on the way you interact with the world and story you finally end up being told. Along the way, you meet a colorful cast of characters like Toriel, the soft-spoken goat mom who knows more than she lets on, Papyrus, the well-intentioned and extremely doofy garden training spaghetti chef, Sans, his brother, the soft-spoken skeleton who knows more than he lets on. I wonder what he's thinking behind that smug little face. Hopefully it's about taking some joke lessons. <laughs> teaches you how to solve puzzles and survive in the land of monsters as you journey to make your escape. But you eventually realize she's also trying to keep you from leaving her sight, so you don't face the wrath of King Asgore Dreamer. See, Asgore needs seven human souls to break the barrier and free his people, and he already has six. And not only is he sending Undyne, the head of his royal guard, after you, but you're heading right into his hands yourself because that's the only way out. Not exactly looking good for you. Along the way, you also meet Alphys, the anxious royal scientist and her ratings crazed robot invention, Metaton. And they, and everyone else you meet, have all these great little nuggets of meaty postmodern dialogue that really adds some weight to all of the silly proceedings. Because you interact with characters almost exclusively through the battle screen, even when you're talking it out with them and either murdering them or convincing them to let you spare their lives, the mechanics are actually inseparable from the storytelling. Games like Earthbound and Bioshock reach levels of this, but only in the last few years have games like Undertale and The Stanley Parable truly taken games as art into the next phase, where not only are people making games about games and how they relate to our lives, but also there's now an audience for them. Undertale's story is a perfect blend of simple plot and effective use of theming. The story is easy to follow, and the characters wear their motivations on their sleeves, so that Undertale's deeper messages about whether or not traditional JRPG game mechanics are morally correct, or triumphing over your own insecurities in the face of unfairness, shines through all the more clearly. It's a complete package, and every working part comes together and fills me with determination. Let's take a look at some of those details now. Ah, determination. I get that reference. Thanks, bro. That's, that's... For that that's a common phrase they use in this yeah, in this game. You'll the, see determination it's one of the everywhere. Main phrases. Get ready. You feel determined. Get ready for some some phrases. Now, while this game couldn't be farther from the traditional 16-bit RPG, it doesn't take too many crazy risks when it comes to presentation. Instead, it does exactly what you'd expect, and it does it super duper well. 
The sprite work is masterful, funny and endearing, and the individuality of the characters shines through in their dialogue as much as in their simple and weird designs. Look at Naps the Blue, the very socially anxious ghost. Great look, great dialogue, great song, perfect. And the same goes for the color palette. Seems authentic enough for at first glance, sure, but something about the muted tones or the slightly sickly hues tips everything over from odd to memorable and extremely evocative. I will always remember Toriel and her weird purple smock and house. And it's not just because we murdered her in cold blood on accident, but, sorry. But, so, and I'm sorry. instead of reminding me of that awful memory, I'm going to segue into talking about the soundtrack because damn, Toby! You killed it with the songs, Toby! It's like, I'm always humming something to myself and trying to figure out which Final Fantasy it's from and then it's just always from Undertale, Toby. How did you do that? What is that about? The point is, the game cuts absolutely no corners. Sure, it came out a little later than it originally said it would on Kickstarter, but does anyone really care when it turns out this good? <sighs> Someone always cares, bro. Really? Instant gratification still wins out over quality most of the time? <sighs> yeah, my dude. Damn. That's too real, dude. Right? After all this intellectual discourse, I bet you didn't think the first thing I'd say is that the coolest thing about Undertale's battle system is that it's a fusion between turn-based RPGs like Bravely Default or Dragon Quest and bullet hell shooters like Raiden or Geometry Wars. A little red heart is tied to the kid's HP, and by moving it around in the small square on the battle screen, you can literally dodge enemy attacks in real time. So, so, so addicting and fun. I can't believe nobody thought of this before. I mean, maybe they did. Good job, whoever... Toby or who? It's, it's good. It's, it's good. Well, wherever the idea came from, Undertale definitely elevates it off the charts by giving every single enemy completely unique attacks that do everything from dynamically changing the size of the box you can move around in to subjecting you to wave after wave of flexing Murhorse bicep. In general, this game doesn't deviate from the formula too much, except that you can also just decide not to fight anyone if you want. This sentient mold here seems like too good of a guy to take down like that, right? No problem. Just talk to him a little bit and convince him not to fight. By making every battle a moral choice, it connects your emotions to the mechanics of the game and then uses them as a gateway drug, causing you to start looking for deeper meaning in places you never considered before, like item descriptions or in the menu. So earlier I said on our first playthrough we killed the goat mother known as Toriel, right? Regardless of whether or not you reload your game save or not, Undertale remembers stuff like that and does not let you forget it either. And the more you deviate from a straight, unbroken playthrough with no breaks, and the more choices you make, the game continues to change slightly until your experience feels significantly real and unique to you. It's a great example of how a relatively small game can create this illusion of infinite depth with a handful of awesomely written little acknowledgements of your personal impact on the game world. Take note, game designers. Toby. It also changes the pacing of the game a bit, and even though the game's only a few hours long already and grinding is totally optional, it still feels like it flies by, because it never hits that repetitive stride more hardcore games might. By the time the kid finally gets to Ascor and the barrier, Alphys has already told the kid that they cannot pass through the barrier with a human soul alone. There has to be a monster soul too, which is why now, no matter whether you've been good or bad this whole time, you have to take Asgore's life. He even destroys the mercy option on screen. And also Toriel is his ex-wife, which means she was once the queen. Crazy. The fight is a little challenging, sure, but it's not so much difficult as it is sad. And in this version of the story, no matter what happens or who kills him, be it you, Flowey, or himself, Asgore ends up dead. Then Flowey calls everyone an idiot, absorbs all six of Asgore's human souls, and then the game crashes. Literally, the game just Alt F4 crashes you. Load it up again, and something's not quite right. Flowey's replaced your save file with his, and when you load it up and try and get yours back, he destroys it, and the fight with Photoshop Flowey begins. Maybe it's because he's absorbed all those souls, but Photoshop Flowey looks more realistic than any other character in Undertale. And unlike any other fight in the game, this one ditches RPG mechanics completely for a straight up bullet hell showdown. Flowey reveals his own control over the game's save and reload functions by abusing them in real time, killing and resetting the poor kid over and over and generally tripping everybody out. But eventually he goes down, and then, depending on who you killed or spared, you will get one of between 12 to 25 different endings. Sorry, just... It's okay. Stating it now. Yeah. 
Then the credits roll and boom, you did it. You finally finished your first playthrough of Undertale. Now to do it again like 25 more times. Hey, work for Resident Evil 2. Don't worry, you'll be fine. Come on, let's go. Don't you even compare these two games. Kind of though, right? Whatever, technically, maybe. I, yeah, yes, whatever. Yeah, yeah. Now I know I kind of breezed past it, but like I said, there's a bunch of different variables having to do with choices the kid makes, and who's dead, and who's alive, that impact exactly which ending you will get. And as you can see from all this crazy footage, I actually did go back and meticulously record every last variation but I'm not going to list them all here. Instead, I'll toss a link to the Wikia page in the description and you can check them all out there. The one thing we did not do was hack the game, but if those things become available without hacking, we'll show you how to do that stuff too. Brave of you, man. Aside from that, there's a few other cool nuggets I don't want to miss before we move on. Firstly, when you find the shopkeepers Caddy and Braddy, you'll discover a weird item they're selling called the Mystery Key. Buying it gets you access to the house right next to Napstablooks, and reading the diaries inside reveals that it used to belong to more positive ghosts named Hapstablook. Hapstablook wanted to have a body real bad, so one day Alpha showed up to his human fan club meeting and revealed plans for his new invention, implying that Hapstablook is in fact Metaton, which is a fun extra tidbit that's not definitely necessary, but also really cool. There's also two secret bosses in the game. One is Glide, who's accessible in Snowden if you walk around near the mysterious door for a few minutes depending on the number of monsters you've killed. He's pretty funny, but I also never had any problem beating him, so don't bother unless you're really curious or you just need the XP. The other is So Sorry, a weird baby elephant looking art student that appears only if you read the sign in the art club room while your system clock reads October 10th at 8pm in the hot land. Again, not a super tough fight, but he does have his little doodle bog cronies on the side, so don't underestimate them or you'll die when you shouldn't have. That's it for now. Be warned. That's it for now. Hint, hint. For me, the idea of a game with this many little moving parts and special interactions is extremely stressful, and imagining all of those slightly different playthroughs and all the little recordings needed to capture definitely made me have a panic attack a little bit. But also, it felt like it was kind of on purpose too, right? Obviously, Undertale has some sort of big idea it's trying to get across, but keeping everything straight and trying to exhaust every last lead over and over in repetitive playthroughs made me wonder if we were ever going to be able to fully comprehend it as a whole. And honestly, I'm totally fine with that. Except for an experience that's supposed to be something like an escape, I found myself making a lot of blind choices just to sort of find out what happens. I don't want to spoil anything, so I never looked it up, but let me just say, playing like that isn't very fun, especially when I know I have to somewhat discuss Discover every last bit of it. And eventually, yeah, once we felt we'd gotten the most out of the story, we turned to a guide to help us mop up the rest of the endings, boring as it was. Still, the pluses from my first playthrough of the game very much outweighed my minuses from the next 25 times, and I can't really knock it. True, it has been a pain in the butt, but I wouldn't say do what I did as much as I would say play around a little bit and just see what fun surprises you might discover. Trust me, you'll have a way better time. Undertale is a great video game. Is it a masterpiece? Possibly. Is it an untouchable god game with so much girth you can never fully kill it? Certainly some people feel that way. I know it, I even get it, I think. But in terms of this review, I really gotta say, depends on you. Yeah, I felt that too, but even after it was all over and I had time to digest everything I'd seen, I still think about Undertale a little bit every day. The point is, the game is more about the feelings that you have while you're playing it than doing things a certain way. And who am I to tell you what you want from the game? Yeah! So, with that in mind guys, we give this game our completionist rating of Play It. Play it.
Yes! You know, I've got this weird feeling that everybody already knows about Undertale, so let's kind of focus on what Flowey says at the end of the game. Is killing really necessary, huh? Get back to the end without killing a single thing, huh? Interesting. Last time through, we weren't exactly sure how killing affected the game, but now that we are, the path seems pretty clear. Time to do a pacifist run, baby. Pacifist? Like what the babies put in there? What? Oh, never mind. Dude, that's a pacifier. No, no never mind. I thought we were talking about pacifiers. Right, yep. Baby stuff. Yep. Yeah. Whoa, something weird is going on here, isn't it? Eh, whatever. Here's another spoiler warning. We're just about to give away more plot. If this is all too much for you, I'll say it again. You might have a better time just watching some anime. Anime! So as you know, a pacifist run implies that nobody dies, which is awesome for storytelling purposes, but it also means that in the case of Undertale, you have to do extra side missions and quests as well. In this case, Papyrus and Undyne survived their boss fight encounters, and now you have to go on a date or a hangout session with them. Take Papyrus out on a date, and even though he wears a dope outfit and there's plenty of spaghetti to be had, he'll decide you're a little too into him and he'll leave you with his phone number. Next, if you're not a murderer, Papyrus encourages you to meet him and Undyne to hang out, and then immediately ditches you to force you to become better friends. If everything works out, you learn a little bit more about what makes Undyne tick, and she'll eventually call you later to help her to deliver a certain letter. But this is not before she tries to kill you. Like, she's hunting you down for a good 15, 20 minutes, and then she decides to be your friend. It's a great, great dichotomy kind of thing. The letter is for Alphys, and it seems like it might be a love note, because once Alphys reads it and mistakenly believes it was the kid who wrote it, she immediately asks you on a date to the garbage dump, where she reveals her once important role as a scientist has been reduced to her lying about her interests and sitting around watching anime all the time. Undyne overhears, and they have a tough reconciliation. Tell Undyne whether you think anime is real or not, and boom, you're all set. See you in the final level, bro. Anime is real. Anime! What the hell was that? Since nobody ever dies in your pacifist run, the idea of talking to everyone instead becomes very appealing. And when you do, this game's absolutely excellent writing totally shines through. Remember how cute Onion San was? The dogs who got freaked out by dogs that pet other dogs? Temmies? That one Temmie in the wall? All of it is wonderful and funny and perfect, and it's amazing how vibrant everybody gets when you don't resort to terrible violence. The graphics and the music are also great, but for whatever reason, I feel like I'm being redundant if I try and explain that to you any more than I already have. So let's get out of this segment. I'm getting bored. Because you're never fighting, a lot of the mechanics in Undertale become useless on the pacifist run. In fact, pretty much everything in the game besides the healing items becomes totally useless, so you have to focus your attention elsewhere. Mostly, you have to convince every single character in the game not to fight you, and as the game goes on, it gets really awesome, because every new monster you find is like its own little mini puzzle. Yeah, a lesser game probably would've just let you hit run away and be done with it, but Undertale manages to completely remove the battle system from its RPG and have the battles remain absolutely compelling, because now, instead of their attacks, you're often fighting the monster's depression or their various insecurities. And as a result of forging a personal connection with these monsters you'd normally just crush under your boot, it feels totally worth it every single time. Well, except maybe Flowey. Yeah, Flowey's an asshole, dude. So after setting Alphys on the brutal path to personal betterment, Papyrus suggests you maybe go check out her true lab, which you can find right underneath her regular lab, and basically, it's just an awesome lore dump. When the monsters realized that only souls could destroy the barrier, Alphys was given the task of finding out how to get a monster's soul to stay alive after the monster dies, just like a human's does. She discovered her solution in a uniquely human force known as Determination, and it worked great for a while. Dead monsters were injected with the Determination, and while they would briefly come back to life as normal, their weak monster bodies couldn't keep their form like a human's can, and they melted away in mushy amalgamate chimeras. Alphys couldn't admit her mistake and never went back to work in the lab again, but not before running some experiments on a golden flower, which was sprinkled with the ashes of Asriel, Asgore and Toriel's recently deceased son, who was killed when he tried to return his dead human friend to their village, and everyone there assumed he had just killed him. But because the flower fused with only a tiny part of his soul, when Alphys treated the seed with determination, he came back 
to life as Flowey, but no longer had feelings and instead gained the ability to save and load. You're actually stuck down in the true lab with no power while you read all this. But once you collect all the keys in that lab, you meet Alphys, and she thanks you for finally giving her the courage to go public with all her weird experiments. It's kind of cute, but it's also extremely sad. Back in Asgore's chamber, since you've been a pacifist this time, Toriel steps in before you can fight him and stops the bloodshed. Then all your other friends arrive, including all the monsters you've spared, and things are looking pretty good for once. That is, until Flowey shows up, captures everyone, and shows you how powerful he really is. Imagine Bill Murray in Groundhog Day, and how after reliving everything so many times, he's totally mastered it. That's Flowey right now. And then he soaks up everyone's souls and uses it to return to his normal goat man form. Everyone lends their power to yours, and eventually you end up taking all your friends' souls back by using all the info you got from getting to know them. Next, you repeatedly refuse to fight back against Asriel, even when he grows into a giant winged demon, until he's reminded of his first human friend from back when he was a kid, and he lets everyone go. The kid finally reveals to Asriel that their real name is Frisk, and once he walks off, everyone decides it's finally time to go back to the surface. But before you do, you can go back through the entire world map, and every single character now has new dialogue celebrating the new status quo. You can even go back to the very first area where you originally first met Flowey and find Asriel there, who has some nice things to say, but also decides to not rejoin society above ground just yet. That doesn't stop everyone else though, and the final scenes of the game are the whole crew looking out at the sun for the first time in forever, and you get to decide whether to live with Toriel happily ever after, or go back to the surface and live happily ever after. Both endings which are super beautiful and happy. What a beautiful story, what a beautiful world, and what a beautiful game. I think it might be the best game ever. I agree. Hell yeah. You know it. Just before you're all finished out, there's one last challenge in the pacifist ending. As the credits begin to roll up, it then cuts to Asriel, who's demonic as ever, and then jokingly challenges you with the special thanks Kickstarter backer credits. And suddenly, the whole screen turns into one giant dodging game. It's very tough to get down. In fact, when I get to the end of this, you're gonna find out how many times I ended up doing this. But in the end, once you've done it, you'll have unlocked the mysterious door in Snowden, which houses a couple of dogs and a computer they use to write the game. It's not the most satisfying bonus ever, but it also feels kind of tied to the Kickstarter stuff, which is already kind of tacked on anyway, and it in no way affects our love of the game. Also, at the end of the game, when you talk to Sans, reset without saving so you can talk to him a couple more times. And eventually, after giving you a secret code for just time travelers, you'll get the key to his room. Mostly it's just fun Sans stuff, but if you grab the key from his drawer, you get access to another weird workshop room, which seems to hold some secrets to some much deeper lore. But I'll leave that stuff to better qualified theorists. Also, now that you know the kid's name is Frisk, you wouldn't be a very curious person if you don't try starting a new game with that name. For if you do, you'll end up in hard mode. Now, hard mode is basically just a remix of the ruin section of the game, with some more to come possibly someday, not really because it seems like a joke. Of course, when the annoying dog announces the end of the game during the final fight with Toriel, Toriel gets pretty incensed about it, ruining her moment, and the dog is vague about whether more of it is ever going to come. I hope so though, because damn, this game is amazing. I want to know every last thing about it. Me too. Hashtag Ollies. Hashtag Kickflip. Hashtag Christ Air. I want to be clear, this game can basically do no wrong at this point, but if we're talking about challenges we faced, other than the Kickstarter credits, the biggest thing we struggled with is ourselves. Yeah, see, this game actually uses its mechanics to serve its larger themes, and because Alex and I spent our childhood playing Final Fantasy, Earthbound, and Dragon Quest, the idea of letting a monster live because it's unfair really messed with our instincts. It was hard to stop trying to play every JRPG ever and start playing Undertale. It was worth it though! What a satisfying ending and nobody even had to die! Nothing's ever gonna be bad again! What could possibly ever happen? Quite literally, Undertale has restored my faith in humanity. It's just the lesson we all needed. Finally, everyone can be friends. Just like us, and like you and your friends, and from all of us to all of you, be nice, okay? Okay!
In the genocide run, you kill everyone and everyone's afraid of you, except Papyrus who believes in you no matter what, but you f kill him anyway. Flowey literally begs you to just leave the game as it is, happy and wrapped up, but you just do it anyway. You'd even have to strike down a kid in cold blood if Undyne didn't step in and stop you. And then you kill Undyne too. You know what's worse than that? You know what's worse than everything? To justify your behavior. They give you this really messed up, perverted serial killer personality and it legitimately makes you feel awful. Anyways, we'll see how that pans out later. I feel like I've already done this or something. Just go to presentation. That's a wonderful idea. I don't even care anymore. Killing people makes the music worse, way worse. Like you start to feel crazy and warped and sick and evil. Empty towns, empty villages, less friendly menus. The game is less pretty when you're evil and it gets less and less fun as you go. You literally have to watch your character get excited to murder people over and over and over again and practically no one ever even stands a chance. It's impressive. And really, it's the little things that get you. Look at this Hotland sign. Normally it lights up and rolls, but since no one's around because they're fearing for their own safety, it leaves you feeling like you're wandering around Disneyland after the apocalypse. Damn. Rip Mickey. Rip Goofy. Rip Papyrus. Yo, get that real shit out of here, dog. Rip Sora. Oh my God. Kingdom Hearts is never <laughs> coming. <laughs> The one silver lining to the genocide run is that you finally have some incentive to try out all the weapons. And while that's not much, at least we get to say that Undertale does not skimp on the weapons. Battle is based around timing your button presses with the indicator on the screen, and each weapon has its own sort of pattern. And to fulfill the genocide prophecy, you have to kill everyone. And I mean everyone. Every zone, every character, they all have a number that you have to kill at each save point. You know the area is clear when you've engaged in a battle and literally no one showed up. It's pretty fun stuff, actually, but it's not as fun when you have to kill innocent creatures. Yeah, the game suggesting that being a decent person is the right thing to do makes you feel much worse about killing everything. It gives you perspective on the generally much more nihilistic, kill everything logic of most video games, and I don't even think I'm being unfair. Mario kills everything, even the angry birds kill everything. Right, and because of that, Undertale never allows killing to feel fun. It legit makes you feel like a bad person. Check out how much worse it feels when Papyrus sets up a bunch of puzzles for you and you just walk past them because all your character thinks about and cares about is killing and you know you're about to kill again. And even when you kill Papyrus, he even forgives you and you still kill him in cold blood. Awful. This game is awful. It makes you feel awful. I feel awful right now. This feels like I, I had a burrito and it's tearing apart my insides. I feel like I tried Kentucky Fried Chicken's Nashville. Oh my god, that is the yeah. worst. Get me out. Now I do want to add that you can at any time decide to switch from a pacifist run to a neutral run or from a genocide run to a neutral run. In fact, that's the main reason why there's so many different endings because you can just jump out from any point. But with genocide, one could argue there's two different endings, but the results are the same outcome. By the time you arrive at Asgore's house, things are totally messed up. You're rummaging through his house, stealing knives, and thinking in an evil voice like you'd been there before. Also, Flowey begins to talk with you. He talks about how saving and loading slowly turned him into a killer too, and berates any viewers out there watching this right now that didn't have the guts to do the genocide run themselves. But when he realizes that you mean to kill him too, he runs away and hides. Then you run into Sans, who's really kind of in that not mad, just disappointed mood. And really, once he reveals himself as a timeline guardian who lives outside of time and save states, <laughs> He's kind of the real final boss of the game. 
He's absolutely the hardest fight. It'll probably take you a few hours to get the timing down. And since he remembers every time you die and reload, he gets pretty dang good at roasting you too. Also, if like us, you started to really feel awful about murdering everyone you love, Sans also has the dirtiest trick of all. About halfway through the fight, he appeals to whatever good there is in you and promises to pretend like this never happened if you hug it out and let bygones be bygones. Except once he hugs you, he instantly kills you and begs you to never reload. Not to mention it says get dunked on the f screen. Cool. Hey Sans, f you dude. Not that I blame you really, but damn, that's a dirty ass trick, especially in the middle of a really hard boss fight. Then you move to kill Asgore, but Flowey finishes the job for you in a last ditch attempt at getting your best graces before losing his nerve and begging for his life in the grossest, most sniveling manner possible. <laughs> You butcher him until there's literally nothing left. You monster. But then, there comes the biggest twist of all. What if I told you that the fallen human that you name at the beginning of the game isn't the protagonist at all, but rather the childhood friend of Asriel Dreamer? And what if I told you this character is the in-game representation of you and your will within the game, separate from Frisk, which obviously, judging by all the awful stuff you just did, gives them the power to control other people and use them as mindless killing machines? Canonically, this character is called Chara, but really, it should just have your name on it. Because the final reveal is that not only is your own will responsible for all the death, but that it also has a mind of its own, which is why, regardless of whether or not you chose to join forces and permanently erase the world, it finally kills you. There's a jump scare, the game crashes and brings you back to the desktop, and that's it. The game's f***ing over. You reload it, and Undertale is just a black screen and howling wind. God damn it. However, I realize we're not all monsters who want to find out everything that happens no matter the cost, so if Undyne's sacrifice actually does affect you so much that you decide to abandon your genocide run, you can also get the Alphys ending, where Alphys leads all the monsters from Hotland and the core to safety and becomes their ruler, which is great for her because it finally gives her a reason to better herself. But it's not great for us because now we just murdered half the kingdom for no reason. And that's lame. But then it gets even worse. If you reload the game after you finish your genocide run and watch the Howling Black for about 10 minutes, Char will appear to you again and offer to reload the world in exchange for your soul, which finally gives you access to the soulless pacifist and genocide runs, which are basically the same as they just were, except that something's just a little bit off about the end because you're possessed by Chara and no matter what you do, Chara kills everyone, even in the pacifist ending. And as long as you want to keep playing your same file, it's tainted forever with these perverted versions of the endings. So essentially, this game is anti-completionist. It encourages completionists to stop halfway through and leave the game alone. Because if you in fact complete this game, you will permanently corrupt your save file. Now sure, you can go in and delete System32 and all that fun stuff, but it's anti-completionist. It's anti-me. It's true that the genocide run has extra grinding, but that's not all that makes it the toughest playthrough. Undyne and Metaton both get new forms when you fight him, and while Metaton Neo is basically a joke, Undyne the Undying is one tough customer, and Sans is probably one of the hardest boss fights I've ever seen. Yeah, and it sucks because the whole time I'm struggling to just barely beat these former friends, I feel terrible about it. And look, this basically means that being the completionist actually forced me to be evil, and and frankly, I'm starting to resent the idea that anyone, much less the game itself, should ever imply that there's a proper way to play such an open-ended game. Why did I have to go through this, internet? Tell me why. I'm a good dude, but you know what? Screw it. Maybe I really am evil. Maybe I should just delete the whole channel. Mark, flip the goddamn switch. All right, guys, look, the cycle stops right now. This is what Undertale is for us. In the end, 
Undertale is a game for us and about us as gamers. We struggle sometimes with those who are different from us. We're afraid of being alive sometimes. Sometimes we can't even make choices for ourselves. But thankfully, Undertale also offers us some advice. Regardless of who anyone is, always be nice because true evil blackens your soul forever. And please try your best to find satisfaction in your own unique experiences and life choices because sometimes wanting to know everything isn't necessarily possible without actually doing something wrong. Damn, right? Getting my pros on. With 10 to 15 endings, this game will keep you looking forever for answers and answers and answers and answers. Guys, look, Undertale is a game about you and what you think and what you want to think. So make sure that as you play it, you stay true to that idea and let other people stay true to their idea of what Undertale is for them. Yeah, just think for yourselves. Just think for yourselves. With that in mind, guys, we give this game our completionist rating of finish it. Finish it. That's all the time we have for today, guys. And believe me, it was a lot of time put into this freaking episode. I did not mean to do that. <laughs> Let us know what your thoughts are in the comments below. Question of the day: Have you played Undertale? And if you have, what does Undertale mean to you? Really, uh, take this time to go on Twitter and thank Toby for. And, and Temi and everyone who made this this game. This game is really a wonderful piece of, of art that I think is it's yeah. great. If you I, played it already, come back to it in like five years. It'll be way good again. Uh, it's, it's good now, and I think it's it's, it's going to be good then. Um, so thank you guys for watching. Please, if you uh, liked the music you heard today, it was off of the Determination uh, soundtrack by two of my good friends who are YouTubers, uh, Ace Waters, and I always, it's like, Rich, Richard, Rich, it's like, see, I always f it up. Richard, like Richard. 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 All of the cover music that you heard today was a part of the Determination soundtrack uh, made by Ace Waters and Richard. I ruin that Richard. name every time. Richard, put his name on screen. Guys, if you wanna <laughs> buy that album, I believe it's uh, $13, $10 or $13 on Bandcamp right now. Uh, links in the description below. Support those guys. Uh, they were officially endorsed by Toby to make the album and it's awesome It's, it's got a lot of great content good. creators on there, too So go support them download the album and thank you uh, today for spending so much time with us now If you would excuse me, let's check out this picture of this woman Who's stamping on grapes and then she falls as she hurts herself. It's a classic video. No, that's not the point. That's it. no, yeah, it's, it has to be related to Undertale. All right, now, now, if you'd excuse me, excuse us, excuse now, if, us. now, if you would excuse us, <laughs> now, if you would excuse us, please check out this cover of the dog song from Undertale done by something weird. Mark, fill in the weirdest cover of it that you can find on the weirdest musical instrument. Now we're using all of that. We're using all of it. Let's now, if you would excuse nope. me, you're alone. You're alone. That's it. If you would excuse me, I would like um, you to PayPal me money. Send me money for free. Send it to my Gmail. Why not? Find me. PayPal me free money at the end of this. If you're here, you got a hundred bucks. Send it my way. I'll take it. I'll take it. Now, if you'd excuse me. All right. <laughs> stop him. Stop him. We're done. That's it. That's it. <laughs> 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 Listen.